everyone, my name is Laura and this is IRCLAS Expert Talks. The digital revolution, which began about 25 years ago, alongside our individual gains, has had a huge influence on the workforce. All businesses are looking at new ways how to use technology for their advantage, how to communicate better with customers, how to allow more flexibility and speed up processes with automation. And since the worldwide pandemic had shut down most in-person business activities, these adoptions have become even more important. And the aviation industry should prepare to be at the front lines of this successful digital change, both customer facing and behind the scenes. Today, I'd like to explore this with someone who's already been in charge of these kind of changes. And that is our class instructor, Alex Popovich. So Alex, thanks for being here. Thanks, Laura. It's a great pleasure to have a chat with you. Wonderful. So our plan today is, as always, to talk about Alex's experience in aviation industry, e-learning, and of course, answer this question, what is digital transformation and why it is important? So without any further ado, I'm going to begin, Alex, with uh, your background, and I want to know more about your experience in the aviation industry. So could you just tell me and our viewers how your career began in this industry? Well, thanks, Lara. Um, I'd say it began as a, a sequence of events and then the passion came later. Uh, I was a pretty well a late starter in aviation. I, I was trying to remember the first time I ever went on an aircraft and I think I wasn't until I was 24. I was in academic life and I remember flying to Berlin and at that time crossing what was West Germany to East Germany. Uh, in a coach and going to a, a, a conference. Um, so at that time, um, it really wasn't in, in, in my DNA. Uh, before aviation, I was in academic life. I did uh, a degree in maths. I did research in maths and physics. But uh, at that point, there was then a fork in the road. And because of my Eastern European background, surprisingly in the UK, they wouldn't let me join the civil service. So I was quite taken aback by that. Um, but aviation came along and British Airways came along. So um, I took the leap from academic life. Um, I applied uh, to the IT department and eventually they accepted me. Um, the funny thing was, Probably about a, six months in, I thought I'd made a terrible mistake because technology at that time was so boring. You know, it was mainframe, it was maintenance. Um, so um, I thought, right, I'm going back to academic life. This is not a good idea. But um, I was really then inspired by a leader in British Airways, a guy called Keith Rapley, uh, and he was in charge of the operational research unit. You could call it what is now data science. Um, you know, it basically it was about bringing data to bear to take on a decision uh, and guide decision makers in the organization as to what, what are the options and what was the best path to take. And from then on, um, I progressed in the IT department. I moved to cargo. I was in charge of IT for British Airways' world cargo unit. Um, I then moved into World Cargo and set up the uh, what was then a new network management function for cargo, including revenue management. I moved to the passenger side, revenue management. Um, and then I was approached by IATA to be the global head of cargo. And then with a number of steps, I became in my last job um, with um, IATA, I was um, the Senior Vice President of Customer Financial and Digital Services. So those were a great sequence of events. I was enormous and still am enormously grateful to British Airways and IATA uh, for those opportunities. But um, through that period, um, I really generated a passion for uh, working in aviation. And I think one element of the, the passion is the sheer challenge of working in aviation, I honestly can't think of another sector where every day is different. Now, obviously, we had 9-11, uh, and more recently, we've had uh, the impact of COVID, uh, and that demanded extreme measures, but never a day would go by uh, without the challenge that you would have 
uh, within the industry. So that was one point of passion for me, the excitement for the challenge rather than the fear of it. Uh, the other aspect was the sheer diversity of roles uh, that were within the organization. You could be a pilot, you could work in finance, you could work as I did in revenue management or change management. You know, just the diversity of the, the opportunities were really became a passion for me. And uh, you mentioned, you know, the kind of amount of challenges that one faces once working in the uh, aviation industry. But doesn't that get tiring after some time or is it still kind of exciting? Well, I think when you stop doing it, maybe you realize how tired you are. But when you're positive and energized by the challenge, you are focused and, and it generates a new energy that you never thought you had. And I think the collaborative spirit that aviation has, and I would say both within the company and outside the company, not just working in IATA, but you know, I would say even at British Airways, you realize uh, the power of people collaborating, communicating together to solve a problem, basically generated an energy. So yeah, it was tiring. You, you would forget how tired you were maybe when you went home and sat down and maybe had a drink or two, but it was a magnet to basically bring you back. Um, and um, it really has been an inspiration. And, you know, for any of you, you know, thinking about aviation as a career, I would obviously heartily recommend it. I think there's new challenges like sustainability, um, financial, social and environment. But I think the industry is really committed uh, to addressing those issues as well. So I, I can't recommend enough um, working in the aviation industry. That's really good to hear. I mean, from kind of the first hand source, you know, about working in the industry. But tell me about those challenges a bit more in a bit more detail. Is there anything that really stands out in your experience, like maybe one assignment or a project that yeah. once you think about it, you know, you kind of think, oh, wow, yeah. I did that actually. Yeah, well, um, you know, as I said earlier, Lara, there were so many challenges through through my career within British Airways and IATA. Um, you know, working in revenue management, for example, I was in charge of British Airways revenue management during the 9-11 period. And prior to 9-11, this was one of the challenges to answer your question. Obviously, revenue management would focus on optimizing the revenue uh, of British Airways. But the objective changed just after 9-11 to focusing on the customer. So revenue management said, OK, well, the demand is taking a real temporary dive, we hope. So what matters now is switching to customer service and keeping them loyal. Uh, so that to me was a big shift uh, in the organization's focus. And at that time, revenue management was really the source of how much cash the company had left. You know, it was in the unique position of saying if things go on, there will be six months, eight months before the company uh, runs out of uh, money. So it was also a catalyst working in collaboration with other commercial and operational functions in British Airways for, let's call it the restart of British Airways. And it inspired innovation uh, in a big way in terms of bouncing back. So that was one example in British Airways. But I think a recent example of a challenge, if I look at IATA, was meeting the COVID challenge. And one of my responsibilities was uh, looking after uh, hundreds of billions of dollars um, of the industry's money for financial settlement that would flow through IATA's BSP and its cargo equivalent, the CAS. And you can imagine during COVID, uh, demand dropped and in normal periods, um, sales was much more than refunds. But during COVID, it was actually in reverse. Refunds were much, much bigger than sales through the financial settlement systems. So during that crisis, it's very important, I learned, to set a very simple objective. And that was just keep the cash flowing no matter what between the agent and the airline. So I think that most recently was the biggest challenge for me. And it was a great 
team. It goes back to the characteristics I spoke about area earlier about the need for collaboration. Uh, even the team, like all of us in COVID was impacted. The whole team had to stay at home, but we were fortunate to have business continuity measures to keep the cash flowing. And I'm very pleased to say the team was successful uh, in doing that because, you know, as you know, cash became the lifeblood of the industry and one cent lost was really uh, devastating for both the travel agents and the airline. And now that you face those challenges, and of course you've been in the avi aviation industry for over 20 years, I believe, um, and you talked about your team and yourself, what are the most important characteristics someone that should have uh, to succeed in this industry? What do you believe that is? Well, well, I think I've given you a, a few illustrations of what they could be, uh, you know, during the experience that I've had. But the first characteristic is always keep focused on the customer. Look at everything you do through the lens of the customer, the customer, whether it's a corporate, whether it's a leisure traveler on the cargo side, whether it's a logistics provider. I would put that as number one, Lara. The thing that I've learned is it shakes you out of your inward thinking. And uh, during the example I gave you of crisis management in British Airways and IAT, it was that relentless focus on the customer. Uh, focus on the customer. Hopefully they'll be loyal to you so that, so that when things come back, that will put you in good stead. So that will be one I would focus on. The other is you are absolutely passionate um, to collaborate. You want to collaborate because the truth is things cannot get done unless you collaborate both within your organization and also beyond your uh, organization. Uh, the other thing I would stress is communication. You've got to be really um, going out of your way to make sure that your peer group, your customers, your business partners are fully aware at every time in a proactive way of what needs to be done. So those are just a few areas uh, that I would uh, uh, mention. Actually, there's another one, which is culture. Is The thing that I found is working in aviation, the diversity of views, um, you've got to be comfortable in collaborating with people of many cultures in order to get things done. I'll tell you one story. I can remember when I was in IATA, um, I had one task, which was to promote a new data solution. And I had to do that in so many different countries, ranging from the UK, Australia, Japan, USA, uh, the Middle East. And it was the same message but I had to learn how culturally you de deliver the message. Okay, same message, but delivered in entirely different ways. For example, in Australia, it would be, let's figure it out over a beer. Okay, in Japan, it would be, let's make sure that our subject matter experts meet with the subject matter experts of Japanese airline to prepare the ground, prepare the script, and let's make sure during the meeting, it becomes a ceremony of commitment. Same message, different. So this is a very important characteristic of working in aviation. You've got to be comfortable and willing to learn and respect different cultures uh, around you or else you won't get things done. I think we're uh, already learning bits from you. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, someone who's watching can use this to implement in their own kind of characteristics. Uh, but uh, I want to move, Alex, a bit more into teaching now. As our class, uh, we are an e-learning platform, so teaching is one of the most important things for us. Um, I wanted to ask how teaching got into your life. I don't pretend that I've got a unique story. I've been influenced by great teachers uh, throughout my life, uh, from childhood. Um, you know, from the Serbian community I was brought up in, there were great teachers there, but also in school. Um, and one thing I learned is teaching is not simply about conveying content. It's much deeper than that because, I mean, learning is a better way of putting it than teaching, actually, because learning, you take responsibility for the learning of the person in front of you rather than you just convey content and hope that they will get it. 
Um, so, you know, I was inspired by my maths teacher in terms of their role modeling. He, you know, he was the reason why I decided to go down the mathematics road. Uh, it was a bit of a tall order because history, I was also inspired by my history teacher who was a great storyteller, a true inspiration, but I, I made the choice for the maths. So um, I got into teaching, as I suppose as most would call it, at university. Um, you know, I remember doing some lectures, some tutorials in, in mathematics while I was there. Uh, even beyond university, I would tutor um, I would focus my energy on people aged 7 to 70 uh, because, you know, learning maths, whether you're seven year old or older, uh, for me, it was really a passion. How do you convey the message so that the person learns and can embrace it themselves? But actually, um, although I had a long career in aviation, uh, one thing I learned is that learning is an integral part of doing the job. Uh, as a leader of an organization, uh, you've got to learn and also you've got to ensure that your team learns. And that could take many forms, obviously digital, e-learning, but coaching, mentoring, uh, traditional training. Uh, the one thing I learned was learn by doing is the best way of learning. Learning in abstract really it, well, it didn't work for me. You know, it would go one ear and come out the other. So I think learn by doing was very important going forward. Um, so, you know, now where I am, you know, I'm carrying on mentoring. Um, and very recently, as you know, Lara, I've been approached by Aeroclass. I'm very pleased to uh, uh, say yes, because um, Aeroclass, you've asked me to focus on a key area, which is digital transformation. For the aviation industry and i think it's such a critical uh, not only opportunity but a threat of not doing it for aviation given uh, the circumstances that we find the world in today and i think it's very fitting that you know you talk about digital transformation and we are an e-learning platform which basically kind of turns this in-campus uh, learning onto you know, your virtual screens. But do you think yeah. there's something missing out there for e-learning or is there anything else that needs to be improved? Yeah, well, I think um, it's important to appreciate what is or what can be good about e-learning and then we can talk about what to improve. You know, I think even before COVID, e-learning was growing in importance. And I think during COVID, it just exploded in terms of importance. Uh, and I think that's fantastic. Um, and it really is the way to go. I think in terms of what's potentially good about it, this digital, in other words, being able to learn anytime, anywhere, as long as it's concise, <laughs> um, it's flexible, it's your time, it's um, your place, uh, and also it's relevant. And it may lead to um, a qualification. But as I said earlier, I think COVID has really ramped up the opportunity for e-learning. How can it improve? Well, I think um, it's very important, unless e-learning companies have it already, is to ensure there's a very clear and simple vision, um, which is making e-learning much more than, let's call it a physical training course happening to go on Zoom. I think it's much more than that. Um, you should make it uh, as a vision, you should make learning easy to do and you should tailor it to the needs of the learner. And you should, and what is great about digital, it gives you so many tools, but the tools are only good as, the, as good as the design, which is where uh, um, Aeroclass comes in, uh, which is where the, the teacher comes in to take the rich array of digital tools and to apply them to the learning experience. I mean, um, I, um, I'm currently using Babbel you may be familiar with Alara with Babel. I'm currently butchering the French language uh, using Babel with, with some other learners. And I think it's a good illustration of you take an e-learning tool and you apply a toolkit because your motivation is that the student learns. So it could be uh, lessons. You've got passionate teachers. Uh, they really want to tailor their content to the needs of each student. Um, there will be practice after the session, 
I don't know, in Babel, for example, they have flashcards, they have writing, grammar, uh, but these are all tools um, where you, as the learner, can use it at your own pace. They have a subscription model as well. So it's just one example of how e-learning can uh, improve, further improve, I would say. Um, and, and there's an example of uh, uh, a role model, uh, one of many, I'm sure. But I'm sure Era Class is uh, committed to lapping this up as well. Sure thing, absolutely. Uh, but you're also a, a teacher now, so you get to experience both sides of this e-learning kind of experience. Yeah. As you said, you know, you're learning French and now you're actually teaching people something. So do you think that um, it's somehow different experience? I mean, understand that, you know, beforehand, once you teach someone, you can see their faces, you know, and you can see their reaction to the, you know, information that you're giving them. Yeah. So how is it yeah. different now? Is it a bit more even liberating maybe in any way that you don't see? It, your it, is, it, it is, you know, I think, um, um, you know, obviously in a physical setting, you can see the body language of the student. Are they looking at their iPhone more frequently than often? And there are certain things that you don't easily pick up. But I think as digital learning improves, it will more than compensate for that. And as students and teachers become comfortable with the environment, I don't see that, to be honest, as a big issue. Um, if you want to move on from the initial e-learning experience for it to a more interactive session uh, where I don't know the particular student would say, look, can you coach me? There's sensitive information I can't share in a group setting. Uh, but even that, I think you can conduct that um, in, a, on, in a digital setting. So I think you can push this environment very far, um, even further. I would say, uh, than, than, than a physical setting. I think physical settings are good, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting you throw them away. But I, I think um, given the reality of today's world, uh, the need for speed, the need for people to go at their own pace, it is a big challenge for a physical classroom environment to meet all those challenges uh, in one go. Now let's talk about your course, Alex. Can you yeah. introduce it to our viewers, tell uh, me and them what it is about and who is it aimed at? Yeah, so digital transformation, the, the course is about um, the success formula for digital transformation in aviation. And what the course is about is it's learning from the experiences both within the aviation sector and indeed I've made great emphasis on outside of the aviation sector because I don't think there's special anything special to aviation about digital transformation. So the deliverable in the course is what is that success formula? And what I've done is I've used my own experience of successes and failures in digital transformation, but I've drawn unashamedly from successes and failures outside. Uh, digital transformation and I've pulled that together to share that uh, with the participants on the course. Now who's it for within uh, the course? Now the interesting thing about digital transformation for those of you who will join the course and I hope you will is because it's enterprise-wide I could end up listing everybody in the organization who needs to learn it but I'm not going to do that but what I focused on is those who I would say it's directly relevant to uh, within the organization and I think there's a core group that I would really emphasize and these would be in no particular order by the way the data scientists because I think these are they play a crucial role in bringing evidence to bear on the digital transformation uh, the others I would put would be in the IT area uh, these are people who are um, well versed in what the existing and new digital technologies are uh, that can be applied to the digital transformation. Uh, the other people I would uh, uh, strongly urge to join would be what I'd call the integration managers. These are people who are well versed in the operations, in customer service operations. They're probably the owners of the standard operating procedure. And these people will be the leader of the digitalization of their processes working in partnership with the technology 
manager who knows the digital technology and the data scientists who can bring measurement to bear. So I think that would be the direct group, Lara, that I think would should get value from the course. But it goes beyond that. As I mentioned earlier, it's relevant for uh, if you're in the program office because you're going to be uh, bringing method to bear to deliver that. It's relevant to the finance department because you want to see return uh, from that. It's relevant to the architecture group uh, within, uh, within the uh, company and many more. But, you know, it's quite a array because digital transformation is enterprise wide. Everybody needs in some shape or form to have a command of the subject. So if someone who's watching is in one of those groups that you just mentioned, they should go to ourclass.org, find your course and explore it a bit further with you uh, and with your help, of course. And I want to do the same right here. Um, I had an opportunity to watch the course and there are a few things that I want to talk about right now just for everybody else to kind of get a little bit of a taste. Um, in the course, you talk about the differences, and this is a bit of a tongue twister for me, about digitization, <laughs> digitalization, and digital transformation. There we go. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. So can you better explain the difference between at least digitalization and digital transformation within a business? Yeah, so, you know, I think they are tongue twisters for, you know, even for me with English as a native language, I, I struggle. But um, to keep it simple, um, one is a stepping stone to the other. That's the first thing to remember. So digitalization, it focuses on the redesign of a business process, let's say the customer journey, for example, or the company claims process, for example, but it applies digital technology. So the customer journey, let's say my app, my iPhone, um, my COVID status. I apply that digital technology to the customer journey to digitalize. That's digitalization. I'm using technology to support the change of a business process. That's digitalization. Digitization, you've not asked that, but that's simply about converting um, paper or analog information into digital form and digitalization needs that in order for the business process to be improved. Now, digitalization focuses on a particular business process, one at a time, the customer journey or the claims process or the order to cash process. It's one process at a time. Digital transformation is saying Let's do digitalization enterprise wide, obviously in priority order, but let's make sure we've got the underlining foundations to be able to do the next digitalization even faster and even more successful than the previous one. So digitalization is one process. Digital transformation is the whole enterprise and sustaining it constantly improving it and the customer being the digital customer i should say being at the heart of every change that's going on there in both digitalization and digital transformation i see so i think that's clear right now uh, we can move on from this um but these words these three words that i'm not going to repeat because i'm definitely going to butcher them as you said <laughs> uh, uh, I think they're being used now much more than ever before due to this pandemic. And it's no secret that, you know, this kind of sped up this digital transformation uh, within any kind of business, any kind of industry, because I think that there, there is some kind of an approach that it's better to have something digitalized than nothing at all. And we do see this kind of fast approach to moving everything into the digital space, even if it's not perfect at the very end of the day. Yeah. But do you think that would have happened had COVID not been around? Yeah, I think, Lara, the, the, a number of things. One is these terms, digitization, digitalization and digital transformation. It's very important for the company to have a common vocabulary because otherwise it can lead to frustration, uh, maybe breakdown of trust as well. Um, so that's the first thing. But the second thing to answer your question is, um, I think now digital transformation is not new. I think it was going going on and on. 
But I think it's moved from being an option to being a must. Now, why do I say that? Well, I think COVID has really changed things, not temporarily, but in a number of areas, fundamentally. The digital customer through COVID, like you and me, you know, um, stuck at home, we've become much more tuned in to doing business digitally. Our groceries, our e-commerce, everything. So the reality is the customer has accelerated their digital maturity. And if you're a company, I urge you and aviation really to be relevant to that or else you're gonna be sidelined. Um, so, so really, I think there's a very strong case for change now arising from COVID. It's the digital customer um, changing their needs. Their expectation is uh, digitalization of their experience and those companies have got to wake up now um, or unfortunately be sidelined because those customers will go to companies who get it and move on. So it's an imperative. Uh, do you have any insights into how the airlines now uh, are doing with this? Uh, do you know if they're you know, implementing these changes and maybe there's some kind of a role model to look after, you know, some airline that does this, you know, very well? Yeah, well, I think, yes, the airlines are definitely moving. And I think IAT is playing a critical role uh, during the COVID crisis. I mean, one area is the customer journey. I think during COVID, for health reasons, the need for customer contactless um, is even much more strong than it's ever been before. There has been a move in the past by the industry to make that happen. But, I, but now, customer contactless is becoming not an optional extra, but a must uh, for doing business. Um, the other thing is if customer contactless and um, getting rid of all the paper PCR tests, antigen tests that you need to bring to check in, if that is not addressed, then there is surely going to be a log jam at the airports of dealing with all those customers coming through. So there is an imperative now for customer contactless. I see a number of airlines, even during COVID, I'm traveling, a number of airlines who are embracing customer contactless and making that journey um, easy to do. Um, I, I don't think I want to mention uh, any particular airline, but there's a good number of airlines I've flown on where they are embracing that very quickly. Uh, to their credit, uh, to stay relevant to uh, the customer. So I see COVID as the case for change in the short term. I see customer contactless as a great example going forward. IAT has got a IAT a travel app, uh, which is supporting that cause. Um, it's going to need governments uh, to help the cause in terms of having let me say, simpler, more predictable and more practical measures, which is being pushed by IATA uh, to help that customer contactless process uh, be successful. But from what you're saying right now, it seems that this is definitely in the future when we kind of get to travel maybe without any kind of human contact. Yeah, yeah. I think there's two steps. I think one is the, the crisis is meaning the airline has got to move in order to help its customers uh, achieve their journey in acceptable times through the airport. So that's a short term case for change. But I see this as a stepping stone to a longer term ambition. In fact, not only do I see it, more importantly, the heads of digital transformation in the airlines see an ambition. In fact, IAT has recently announced the ambition by 2030, um, the ambition is for digital airlines, which include at the industry level, which includes many things, including customer contactless as being a part of that. So this is going to be a major push uh, for all airlines in the industry if they haven't already uh, moved. Now, lastly, I want to ask you for a little kind of words of encouragement uh, for those who are now in charge of this digital transformation. What is one thing they have to look out for or maybe something that they need to definitely focus on? Well, I think um, 
uh, as I will cover in the course, uh, it's very important to have a clear digital strategy which is aligned with the strategy of your organization. Without that first step, um, you could be banging your head against the brick wall. You know, you'll deliver some success, but it will not be sustainable. So, so this piece of having a clear digital strategy, aligning it to the strategy of the organization, getting a clear mandate from the CEO and the executive team for that change. You know, that's the place I would start. There's something which uh, is called the digital blueprint, which embodies that digital strategy. And in fact, during the course, I'll be giving a number of um, sections that one would expect to find in a digital blueprint uh, as part of a successful digital transformation strategy. Well, I invite everyone to take a look at Alex's course and explore it further and, you know, get into this world of digital transformation and finally answer themselves why it is important and, you know, why we should do this. Well, Alex, thank you very much for joining me today. I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, I think we had some nice points taken and, you know, people will find this enjoyable and I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you very much, Lara. I certainly did. Well, thanks again. Thanks for everyone who is watching and take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone.